Hi everybody, thanks for thanks for joining us today. This is uh, Chris Patota from Forbes, and this is our uh, Google and Forbes virtual Take Your Classroom to Work Day. Uh, in this session, uh, we're really excited to have with us uh, Ted Hunter from from the Met. Uh, Ted, hopefully you can uh, you can get started here and and tell us a little bit about what you do and tell us a little bit about uh, all those uh, those interesting looking things you have uh, surrounding you in in your room. All right, hi, my name is Ted. I work for the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and uh, if any of you have ever been to an art museum, or maybe even the Metropolitan Museum of Art, you may have seen all kinds of different things in the museum. And one of the really special things about the Met is that we have a great collection of arms and armor. Now there are a lot of different people that work in the building. It's over 2,000 staff members, and that's that's including security guards and carpenters and machinists and conservators and curators and education people and designers. There's a million different things that need to be done every day to make a museum like this happen for the visitors. And in Arms and Armor, I have a very specific job. I'm a conservator, which is a word we use to describe taking care of the artwork. So many years ago, they might have been called a restorer or an art restorer or something like that. Conservator now, because our idea is we really want to take care of all this artwork for the future. We're not here to just fix it up; we're here to preserve it. So I uh, I have a a lot of work to do. Now the, the arms and armor department is not just me. There's there's two conservators. There's collections managers who are they have all sorts of jobs about like taking where everything is and putting it in on display and keeping track of all the paperwork. There's curators who do the research and the study and the writing about these things. And all of us together sort of take care of the collection and put it on display for the visitor. Now, in Arms and Armor, we have 14,000 objects in our collection, which uh, seems like a lot, and it is, but there's only a thousand things on display, so when you come to the museum to see it, you'll see just our best stuff up in the galleries. And then there's lots more down in the basement. We have four storerooms just full of things. And the conservators, myself and, and the others, are always working on taking care of it and cleaning it and fixing it up and, and more besides. So in the galleries we've got armor which is full suits of armor, or even just part suits of armor, like this guy right here, who will be going on display very soon. We've got helmets, other parts of armor, like gauntlets, or just breastplates. We have uh, swords, and daggers, and pistols, and rifles, and horse equipment. We have uh, like stirrups or bridles. Any anybody out there a rider? You like to ride horses? You should come see what we got. We have some really neat spurs and bits and things like that. We have stuff from Europe. We have stuff from China or Tibet or Japan. We have things in our collections from Africa, from Korea, from South America, from North America. We have things that are a thousand years old, and we have things that are a hundred years old. It's all on display. And my job is basically to take care of all of them. Now, uh, there's a lot of different things that I have to do to take care of the artwork. Some of it is cleaning it, which is what you see right here going on. This helmet is something that we uh, acquired not that long ago. Uh, and it came in, there was a lot of rust on the outside. And the, all the little details were hard to see because of the grime and old wax and grease and things that were on it. And all this see here, this is silver. I don't know if you can see it very well. Maybe I can tip it towards the camera. You see those stripes that are on there? Right here, right here. That's silver, and there's like little patterns carved into the metal there. And that had gone sort of black, and it was hard to see. All there was rust and just junk all over the place. And so I've been working on getting this all cleaned up. And I do that with... Uh, little tools like this. So I use things like a little scalpel for scraping rust, or I might use a little tool like that for getting into my little crevices and scraping things away, or I have even, even smaller little tools that do the job. 
And sometimes I need to use a big tool, uh, but not very often. We don't want to go around hitting the artwork too much. Uh, so we don't just clean everything. Um, I've got to watch out for my scalpel blade there. We also display everything. So it's not just about making it clean. It's about making it something that you want to look at. And that means building, for example, mannequins or mounts to hold things up or hold them out away from the wall so that you can get all the way around them and uh, sort of making all these things look their best in the galleries. Uh, we also are responsible for taking care of just our gallery space. For when the visitors come in, you want to see clean glass and you don't want fingerprints. And by the way, kids, when you go to a museum, don't put your face on the glass. I got to clean that. Who does that? Who goes to a museum? If I see some hands, I can see you guys. Who goes to museums? Just one person? What about in Arizona? There we go. I got a lot of hands now. All right. And you want, you want to get up close, right? You want to see it. Please don't touch the glass. No, it's all right. I'm just kidding. We have it. We clean it up every day. It's fine. Uh, but I'm glad you're going to museums. Have any of you been to the Metropolitan Museum in New York? Everybody raise your hand. Everybody from New York. You've been to New York? You've been to the Met? Did you see the arms and armor? I can't hear any of you, but just wave if you saw the arms and armor. All right. That's good. So how did I end up here? That's a, a sub, sort of well, how did I get this job? Where did I come from? So I grew up in Nebraska, and there are no arms and armor collections in Nebraska, but I had a dream that I wanted to come to this museum and work here. I really did. Uh, I didn't think it could happen, but I, I really did want to come here. Uh, so one of the things that I did was I, went, I went, to, went to college. I got my bachelor degree in art history. Now, I did not study arms and armor because nobody was teaching that in Nebraska, I have to tell you. But I did study Greek archaeology because I thought, well, if I can't be King Arthur, maybe I can be Indiana Jones, right? And so I studied archaeology, I studied metals, I studied sculpture, things like that. And then I went to graduate school. And I went to graduate school in London, and there's where I studied how to do things like this. And while I was there, I took an internship. And I went to Philadelphia where they had arms and armor. And I worked on their collection there because I knew about metals. And there was someone there who taught me about how to work on arms and armor. And that was, that was very exciting for me, I, something I'd always wanted to do. And then that, after that, I went to work for the National Park Service. You guys ever go to national parks? Right? You've been to some of the outdoors parks, but sometimes they have a museum too, right? So there are museum jobs all over the place. There's museum jobs in parks. There's museum jobs in historic houses, in art museums, in history museums, in natural history museums. And there's a million different jobs in every one of those museums. There's jobs for people who want to work on the objects. There's jobs for people who like books and you want to be a librarian. Or there's jobs for people who like studying paintings or uh, different kinds of modern art. There's even in the, Met in the uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York City, they even have things in their collection like helicopters, right? Or there's, there's an army museum where my dad used to work. My dad was a museum curator. He worked at an army museum for many years, and they had all kinds of neat stuff there. That was always great going there. So, I, you know, I knew I wanted to work in museums, but what I really loved was the arms and armor. And so, I kind of went out and looked for where I could go and what I could do, and I followed that art history and graduate school, and I got lucky. I ended up here doing exactly what I wanted to be doing. Um, and I think I could take some questions now, right? So I sure. think you guys have some prepared, is that right? Uh, yeah, well, let's start in. Uh, we have we have three different classrooms uh, joining us today, so. We oh, got three. Okay, let's great. Take, let's take them. Yeah, let's let's take them in order. Uh, yeah, we can start with. Uh, let's start with um, uh, Fireside Elementary in Phoenix, Arizona. Anyone uh, in that classroom with uh, questions for our guest? Okay. Hello, I'm Maria. And what's the most historically accurate? I mean, uh, important uh, weapon or p piece of armor that you have in your store? Oh, that's a really good question. What's the most historically accurate armor or weapon we have in, in the collection on display or in storage? Okay. So that kind of depends on the kind of historical question you're asking, but I think the, the, the number one candidate, as far as I'm concerned, would be we have two armors that belong to Henry VIII of England. You remember Big Henry VIII, right? So we have an armor that was one of his very first armors, and it was one of the first armors he had made in his own 
armor workshop in England by, it was in Greenwich is where it was, and it's a beautiful armor. All these things you can see if you go onto the museum's website, in the Arms and Armor section of our website, you can see pictures of these armors. We also have his last armor, and he was a lot older then, and he'd gotten pretty stout, and uh, so you can see the size difference between the two armors. His first one is when he's young, he's a jock, he likes to joust in the tournaments and fight, and it's all gold. And then his last one is this kind of neat armor that's made up of like lots of metal plates that are riveted together, so it's real flexible, and it's sort of a brown and gold color. And uh, but you can see definitely he's got his he's got his tummy going on. So I would say that's probably you know we've we've got other armors that belong to you know. Uh, Emperor Ferdinand or Henry the Second of France, or many famous and important people throughout history. But my favorites are the uh, the two Henry the Eighth armors. So there you go. <laughs> Next question. Let's uh, let's get a question from if there if there are any questions from uh, Lewistown, Missouri. We have a fourth grade class there. Anyone in that classroom with a uh, with a question for uh, for our guest? All right, there's one. Yeah, go ahead, Cameron. What is your favorite piece that you have worked on? My favorite piece that I worked on? Well, um, that's a good question. I, I, I have a lot of favorites, and some that I they made me crazy. Sometimes the job of uh, working on these things is very easy and, and fun, and you get to like reveal a really beautiful surface when you're done. And sometimes you spend months and months working on it, and you're... You, it's never quite what you hoped for, or you're really never quite able to achieve the the, uh, the surface that you wanted, that kind of thing. But probably my favorite thing that I worked on was we had some beautiful pair of pistols by a French gun maker named uh, Boutte. And they came in this box that was carved wood and had the little pockets inside it. It was all lined in velvet. And there's these two beautiful pistols and all the tools you need to clean the gun and you know make your own bullets and it's got your powder. And it was all done in silver. Beautiful, beautiful silver inlay set into the wood. And the, the lock plate has silver on it. The barrel has silver in it. There's, it's just a, the most beautifully made piece of metal work I'd ever worked on. And uh, I took that all apart and cleaned every single little part and lacquered them so they wouldn't get tarnished and black. Put it all back together. And then I, I got to make mounts for it so that they sort of stand up in the display case so that when you come to see it, you can see all the beautiful metalwork really easily. That's one of the, the most important things about this is it doesn't really matter if I spend a lot of time cleaning it if you can't see all the detail that makes this thing such an important art object. So I spent a lot of time making mounts and displaying things. It's not as much time as I spend cleaning it, but it's an important part of it. So as a pair of pistols by detail, I really enjoyed working on those. Next question. All right, great. And our third classroom is joining us. It's a fourth grade uh, classroom from Wisconsin. Any questions for uh, for Ted? Oh, we got lots of them. That's great. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Hello. My name is Inu Yasha, and this is my question. How did you acquire the armor in the museum? Okay, that that's a really good question, and we've got it a lot of different ways. So. Uh, two years ago was the department's 100th anniversary, and the formation of it, the Arms and Armor Department as a separate department, oh, look at that, the little tools are coming through my pocket, um, as a separate department, started with a large gift of a bunch of pieces of Arms and Armor that was given to the museum as a, as a collection. It was somebody's collection in their home that they'd been acquiring for years, and they gave it to us. Over the years, we've had more people give us their collection. Uh, sometimes it's just a few pieces. One guy gave us 3,000 different things. His name was George Cameron Stone, and in 1936 he gave us this huge group of material. And we're still working on cleaning it. Uh, we buy things, either from someone who has it and they want to sell it, or we go to an auction, or a sale of some kind. Uh, sometimes people just give us things. And sometimes they give us things because they like us and they have this thing and they want to give it to us or they might give it to us and say I'd like to give this in memory of someone right uh, so that that person's name will always be on the label with the object it'll say you know armor for man and then there's a thing in the label that says credit line and it says where we got it and it might say 
gift of so and so in memory of so and so. So that's something people like to do is give us gifts. Uh, as I said, we buy things. Sometimes we trade things. Another collection, for example, might have a part of an armor, and we have a part of an armor, and those two armors should be together. So one of us will get those two pieces, and we might give something else to the other one, that kind of thing. So there's lots of different ways for us to get things, and we're always acquiring new material. Uh, you know, we used to acquire, like I said, 3,000 things at a time back in the 30s. Now we're usually getting maybe 20 or 30 things a year at the, on a good year. And all of that has to come through me or the other conservator. We have to look at it before we accept it as a gift or before we buy it. We want to make sure it's real. We want to make sure it's in good condition and that it's something that we can actually display. We want to know more about it. The curators, they want to write about it and publish it. And to do that, they need to know what it's made out of. Uh, you know, maybe we can take it apart, see the inside where you might find a signature or some interesting detail about how or when it was made or where it was made. So the curators and the conservators are always sort of working together for every single object, new or old, to answer all the different questions that we would have about it. Next question. So uh, I'd like to, if, if you don't mind, uh, maybe pull in a question here from our larger online audience. We have a lot of people Perfect. typing in a lot of questions here. Um, so one, one, one that I'm seeing at the top here uh, from a second grader in, in New Jersey, uh, what is the longest time it took you to restore a piece of armor? Ah, <laughs> that took eight months. That was for the armor of Henry II to France. You can see that one on the website as well. It's a full armor, helmet, breastplate, arms, legs, the whole works. And it's, it's an exquisite, beautiful armor. It is entirely uh, what's called repoussé, which is you take a, like this is plain steel here. You see these guys? You see how it's just smooth, right? There's different ways you can decorate that armor. You can put silver on it. You can etch it with acid to put patterns in it, or you can hammer out shapes and patterns in the metal, right? So this armor of, of Henry's has like phoenixes and dragons and lions and things all over it. And those are all covered in silver and gold. Now at some point to protect the armor, they painted it or sprayed it somehow with some kind of protective coating. And that coating had started to turn a funny color and there were some weird things happening under the coating. And it took me probably seven months to get all of that coating off before I could then clean the armor and put my own coating on it that will not change color. So it was about eight months total from start to finish of, of cleaning that armor every day for hours at a time. With, and I had to wear a gas mask because the chemical I needed to take the old coating off was, was not good for me. So I had to wear a mask and I had a fume pulling away. You know, I'd wear my lab coat, things like that. So eight months took me to do that armor. Wow. A long time. <laughs> so we've got about a minute left here. Uh, one, one more question. Uh, if, I, I think we can, we can fit in here. Uh, from a fifth grader in Florida. When you clean armor, uh, obviously you're, you're working with a lot of stuff that's, that's really old. Uh, have, have you ever, in the process of, of cleaning armor, had something break? Yes. Uh, and I would like to say it wasn't my fault. <laughs> well, sometimes you get something that is in just bad shape. And, you know, it's holding together barely. And as you start taking it apart or trying to examine it, you see that pieces are kind of falling off, things like that. Uh, so, and, and there are times where you're not even sure what's going on and you're like, suddenly the piece just kind of falls apart on you. It's a, a horrible feeling for a conservator to have an object in their hand and something breaks like that. Uh, I haven't ever, you know, dropped a helmet and put a dent in it or anything like that. So let's not start today. Uh, but yeah, sometimes things have uh, sort of fallen apart in my hands a little bit as I was working on them. And it's, you, you, you go white as a sheet and you, you're like, uh-oh, what just happened? And then you need to kind of back up and take a look at it. And one of, the, one of the rules we have here is you approach everything very slowly so that that doesn't happen. So, you know, if you just go in guns a-blazing with your hammer or a screwdriver and you start trying to take things apart, that's how you break things. So you set it down on your desk, and you look at it for a while, and you move it around, and you try and understand it before you do a thing to it. Sneak up on the art is the phrase we use, because what you do in haste, you will regret at your leisure. 
So there you go. Great. Well, thank you so much. We're just about out of time here. So thanks again, Ted, for, for joining us. And, and thank you to our, our classrooms who, who joined in. I hope everybody learned something today. And uh, catch you next time. All right. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Thanks for coming.